All right, everyone, we're going to jump into Sikhism right now. This is a religion um, fairly modern that followed Hinduism um, during what we would consider the beginnings of the modern period, late medieval period in the West. They emerged out of India, and this is their uh, famous temple, the Golden Temple, uh, in the Punjab region of India today. They light up at night. I'll show you a picture of that later. But it's a, a very interesting kind of eclectic uh, religion in India that's kind of a mix between classic Hinduism and classic Islam. So, Sikhism. Okay, you can see from the chart at the top, the map up there, um, they are kind of on the border with uh, India and Pakistan, uh, up in the northern part of India. There are several characteristics that distinguish a Sikh, though not necessarily um, different from some of the other practices of a Hindu. For instance, Sikhs have a turban, so many Hindus also have a turban, so not necessarily Sikhs can be identified with the turban, uh, but it is a common identifier for most Sikhs. So it started in the 1500s in the Punjab region of India, as I said. Um, Sikhs, however, unlike a lot of the great ascetics in the Hindu tradition, um, the kind of asceticism that the Buddha would come from and create and found Buddhism, <coughs> aside from this kind of asceticism, Sikhs kind of do the reverse. They kind of embrace physicality, they embrace life, um, they embrace food, comfort, and shelter. Um, the only requirement and stipulation is that you live well, you live morally and upright. But denying oneself does not contribute to one's spiritual development in Sikhism. Now, the early days of Sikhism was uh, more of a passive reformational type of religious movement. It did turn more political in the 16th, <clears throat> the late 16th and uh, 17th centuries. It developed more into a mili uh, militant and political identity. Uh, this just came from uh, local regional bouts uh, with India and then later with uh, the British Empire during the colonization period. So there are the big five Ks that most people distinguish Sikhs by. This would be beards, long hair, they generally don't cut their hair, and turbans, they will wrap up their long hair in the turbans, a comb, a steel bracelet, specific undergarments, and a sword. Now, the sword doesn't have to be a full-size sword, they do have more pocket knife-sized uh, swords that they carry symbolically today, especially if they're traveling abroad, for instance, in the United States, where they wouldn't be allowed to carry such items uh, with them on airplanes. <laughs> Politically, they uphold uh, democracy. Uh, they believe in uh, a democratic rule, and emphasize truth, moral courage, you know, standing up, defending your countrymen, and your home, and your religion, your faith. And modern Sikhs have definitely rejected the Hindu class structure. Uh, this has been um, a really deep-seated aspect of Sikhism. They did a lot of modifications of Hinduism, even if they borrowed some of the teachings and practices from Hinduism. Same thing with Islam. They borrowed many of the features of Islam, primarily the singleness of God, uh, yet they did away with some of the other uh, negative aspects of Islam. So, uh, they rejected the class structure and asceticism. Uh, they make the practice of a gurdwara, eating together for common meal. That's also the name they have for their churches and holy places, holy spaces, a gurdwara. And they developed a three-level system based on ethnicity uh, within the gurdwara. So, uh, they're still democratic, and they don't accept the caste system as a metaphysical structure to the world, um, you know, pulling in morality into the very structure of uh, the physical world. Um, however, they still do have some of their divisions, um, even within their own community. All right, great quote by the Guru Nanak, who's the founder of the religion. He 
says there is but one God whose name is true, the Creator, devoid of fear and enmity, immortal, unborn, self-existent, great and bountiful. The true one is Onanek, and the true one will also shall be. He's talking about Satnam, the one true God uh, in Sikhism. You can see where they borrow some of the aspects of Islamic faith here with the oneness of God, some of his attributes, um, a lot of those omni words everywhere, uh, all powerful, uh, and the like. Now the Gurananic. So he founded the religion in the late 1400s and early 1500s. He was born in a Hindu family. Um, so he was by uh, tradition and ethnic ethnicity Hindu. Um, and he was very inquisitive as a young man and a boy. He studied the Quran, all of the Hindu sacred scriptures, uh, Muslim poetry, many of the holy texts that were available to him at the time. We know that he was married uh, at a quite a young age, in that he had two sons, but we know nothing about them. Uh, he did kind of go on a wandering tour about India, trying to do a spiritual pilgrimage of sorts. And on this journey, he received some kind of a revelation, uh, what he calls the revelation of the true name, the true name of God, the one name of God, while meditating in a forest. After this, as with most young founders of religions who receive revelations outside of uh, human culture and civilization comes back with his new message. There is no Muslim and there is no Hindu. He really wanted to take the best of both religions and put them into a single view of life and God. After his death, he appointed several successors uh, to follow after him. There are nine gurus in all. Uh, the tenth guru uh, is actually their holy scriptures. Um, the Granath Sahib. They consider that to be the final revelation, uh, the final seat of wisdom for Sikhism. Now there were nine uh, gurus spanning a little bit over 200 years. We have Guru Angad, Guru Amar Das, Guru Ram Das Sahib, Guru Arjan Dev. He's the one that built that golden temple that I showed you in the beginning of the video. The Granath Sahib um, were compiled under his leadership. Guru Hargobind, he was the one that kind of moved Sikhism towards a more militant uh, type of faith while still holding up to de democracy. Guru Harai, Guru Harkishan, Guru Teg Bahadur, Gobind Singh and he kind of led the struggle of the people against the Mughal emperor, um, Aruzanzib. This is what has characterized Sikhism as a very militant faith, not necessarily because they were um, militant in nature, but they, because of their religion, uh, they had to protect themselves and their communities, uh, and through outside and opposing forces, uh, this more militant understanding of the faith, defense of the faith, kind of emerged for good historical reasons. So some of their teachings, and a lot of this information I'm pulling from uh, the Sikhs.org website that has a wonderful selection of texts. Uh, they have the Granath Sahib uh, text there as well, some of the teachings of the gurus. I encourage you to go visit the site and do a little bit of exploring. So the very first teaching, the one that Guru Nanak said when he came back from the forest, he said there is only one God, Satnam is the name, the great Guru, Wahaguru, he is the creator, sustainer, and destroyer. So there's just one God. Many Hindus, of course, you'll remember, um, believe in many gods, although the major strand of Hinduism sees um, Ultimately, God is one. There is one God. There's just many different expressions of him through the minor deities that we see in the Hindu tradition. But Guru Nanak saw the plurality of deities in Hinduism um, in his mind as a weakness, and so he 
uh, follow kind of the Islamic way of viewing God as single and one. So he's the creator, sustainer, and destroyer. He's all-powerful. He's in control. Guru Nanak says, You are the creator, O Lord, the unknowable. You created the universe of diverse kinds, colors, and qualities. You know your own creation. All this is your play. A lot of ancient philosophers described God's relationship to the world as play. Um, you might see this pop up in a lot of literature. Essentially what it means is that God is so involved with the world and its creation and its ongoing living and survival that he can be considered um, playing with the world, that the world is his playground. And this is not in a crass way, but in a very serious way, uh, that God delights in the world, that he cherishes it, that he enjoys it, and that he's an integral part of it. Guru Nanak also saw God as being transcendent, above this world, even though he plays within it through his grace. So he says, the formless supreme being abides in the realm of eternity. Over his creation he casts his glance of grace. In that realm are contained all the continents and the universes, exceeding in number all count. Of creation worlds upon worlds abide therein, all obedient to his will. He watches over them in bliss, and he is each constantly in mind. God is all-powerful and all-knowing and transcendent. Since God is transcendent, he cannot take human form. This would be rejecting some of the teachings um, of Hinduism, particularly in um, Vishnu, in the incarnations of Krishna uh, below him, where the gods would take on human forms through various gurus throughout time. This is also a, a Muslim belief, if you'll remember, that Muslims do not believe that God can become man, so therefore that's why they reject Christianity. Gurdjieff says he has neither father nor mother nor sons nor brothers. He's an eternal being, does not need to procreate, he does not procreate, he's a spiritual being, he's not physical. So therefore the Lord does not take birth, he doesn't die, he doesn't enter birth or depart from birth, he is all pervasive. Also in Sikhism, uh, they believe there's no heaven or hell, uh, but there are outcomes to be faced in the next existence. Um, but there's not really this day of judgment type of idea that you see in, say, Zoroastrianism, and Egyptian religion, uh, and some conceptions of Hinduism that do have an idea of heaven and hell um, as waiting places before you're reincarnated. So, the goal of human life is to break the cycle of births and deaths and merge with God. <clears throat> so there's a central cycle that's very similar to Hinduism, uh, of birth and rebirth. However, the end goal is to actually merge and become one with the essence of God, with his being. This is kind of the mystical strand of a religious experience, the kind of vision and experience where you cease to exist and the line between you and God is blurred and is indistinguishable. So one can escape this cycle by following the teachings of the Guru and Gurus, particularly the 10th Guru, the Granath Sahib, meditation on the holy name of Satnam, and performance of acts of service and charity. Sikhs are very huge in service and charity. Uh, they're heavily involved in the founding of hospitals, there are lots of doctors who are Sikhs. They see this as uh, an actual uh, act of their faith, uh, even if it's a secular type of position. Okay, without devotion to the divine name, the birth in this world has gone to waste. So, God is essentially saying, if you're not being devoted to meditating on God's holy name, His oneness, um, you will just be lost. You will not find your path and your way. There's not necessarily many ways 
to attain liberation and or union with God, as there is in the Hindu tradition, there is a general path that you must take um, to experience liberation. Guru Arjan Dev says that true life is life in God, contemplation on the name and the society of the saints. Bhagat Kabir um, goes into detail a little bit. You can read the quote there about merging with God, like water in a stream, this, this, the water in the sea. You can't really t tell uh, what's the wave and what's the water because they're all the same thing. So the disciple of the true God dwells upon the Lord through the teaching of the Guru and all of his sins are washed away. And then Guru Nanak, of course, emphasizing the aspect of service and charity in religious devotion and development. He says, our service in the world gets us a seat in the court of the Lord. So essentially Guru Nanak wants to say, all the asceticism, denial of self, the retreat from society and people that kind of characterizes some of the holy men and holy traditions in Hinduism is the opposite of what God actually wants us to do in life. What he actually wants us to do and what will get us closer to him, get us closer to liberation, is helping others, doing good in the world, making peace. Okay, so you can see a little bit of the, um, the blind devotions that we see in some of the paths to liberation Hinduism. So he rejects um, blindly fasting just because it's some religious duty, vegetarianism, pilgrimages, superstitions, yoga, idol worship, some of these things that are common in some of the um, paths of duty or um, paths of relationships in Hinduism. Devotion, sorry. Guru says this, let good conduct be thy fasting. Um, I think that's a very profound statement that kind of characterizes this worldview of Sikhism and distinction uh, to Hinduism and some of the other traditions in Asia. You keep the fast to please Allah, he's talking to Muslims at this point, but slay life for your relish, but you do not reflect on the Lord who is within you. And, against the Hindu, only fools argue whether to eat meat or not. They don't understand truth, nor do they meditate on it. Who can define what is meat and what is plant? Who knows where the sin lies, being a vegetarian or non-vegetarian? He's getting at the core of asking the question of why you perform the duties and obligations and sacrifices that you do, uh, as opposed to worrying about the actual sacrifice itself. Okay, the world is sinful, it needs to be cleansed, he needs, one must also be in control of their mind, so instead of going on pilgrimages uh, to find unity and relationship to your spiritual leaders that have gone before you, the saints, he says control your mind. This is greater than any pilgrimage that you could perform. This next quote is very important. So the way to true yoga, talking about Hinduism, is found by dwelling in God and remaining detached in the midst of worldly attachments. So it's not getting away from the world that is important, but being in it, but not consumed by it. To be in the world and doing good, but not giving over to sinful desires and sinful pursuits in life. So since they reject some of the ascetic traditions in Hinduism, uh, normal family life is encouraged. So this means the later stages of life, like the forest dweller and the wandering ascetic, um, in the stages of life in Hinduism are kind of rejected in Sikhism. The goal is to not escape from life and family and obligation, uh, but to cele celebrate God in the midst of it. They see that celibacy, not having sex, or renunciation of the world, whether that be economic, social, what have you. Uh, it's not necessary for salvation. You must live in the world and keep your mind pure. So this idea of being 
a soldier, a scholar, and a saint. All three of these uh, dimensions are present in the Sikh worldview. Uh, you must be on guard to defend, have courage, uh, but you also must study and be mindful of the scriptures and the teachings, and then a saint, be a good doer of works and charity. Um, all these three characteristics are the ideals that a Sikh must live up to. The Guru Nanak was actually very um, progressive uh, as well, uh, as far as the, the praise of women. He um, discouraged treating women badly um, or treating them as less human than men. Uh, he encouraged um, not necessarily equality, but to elevate the status of women, to honor them, uh, and to see them as a very important uh, part of life and existence. Okay, um, so these next few quotes really kind of pick up on the aspect of women being respected in Sikhism. Um, they did reject all distinctions of caste, creed, race, or sex. Um, Guru Amanda says, All are created from the seed of God. There is the same clay in the whole world. The potter makes many kinds of pots. Saying that all humans are essentially created equal before God. There's also no caste in the next world, according to Guru Nanak. So he stressed the equality of women. Um, he rejected the practice of sati in Hinduism, which is um, wife burning. When a husband dies, the wife is often burned um, alive and cremated with her husband. Uh, he permitted widow remarriage, um, which was actually pretty progressive. And um, he rejected women having to wear uh, veils. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, that really kind of captures his idea of woman. He says, we are born of woman. We are conceived in the womb of woman. We are engaged and married to woman. We make friendship with women, and the lineage continue because of woman. When one woman dies, we take another one. We are bound with the world through woman. Why should we talk ill of her, who gives birth to kings? The woman is born from woman. There is none without her. Only the one true Lord is without woman. That's very high praise uh, for someone living in the 1500s uh, to put women up on that kind of pedestal uh, as being important. We men would not exist without them, so why do we think ill of them? Um, I think that's um, an amazing point that Guru Nanak makes in his religion. And of course the wife burning. Uh, he wants them to show veneration to their husbands who have died by uh, honoring them with their lives and remembering them. Okay, on this labor and work, uh, so they have a real strong work ethic and uh, not being a beggar or stealing in order to survive. Um, this is why charity is so important in their culture. They don't think that someone should get to that point. So in order to avoid that, um, they have ideals and requirements of giving and serving and feeding those who are hungry. Lots of soup kitchens are uh, run by Sikhs. So honest labor. If you work hard and honestly, you must give something back in charity. It's a social responsibility uh, in the community of the Sikhs. So you can see the langar or the free community kitchen uh, is found at almost every Gurdwara. And um, people of all religions uh, are allowed to attend this place. Okay, they're sacred texts. Um, we had some quotes from some of the gurus, but the Guru Granth Sahib um, is a devotional book. It reads much like the Psalms, kind of poetic. Uh, and it's broken up into different sections. There's core teachings, hymns, and other minor books that um, ponder upon specific topics, practices, ethics, religious teachings, that kind of thing. 
and it's the central feature in the temple. So a lot of times when they in the Gudwara they will have the Granat Sahib in the center. Um, they'll do prayers around it, uh, kind of dances around uh, the Granat Sahib, and it places it's in a central place in the worship space, much like the uh, the Jewish religion has the Torah, uh, the scrolls containing the first five books <coughs> of the Old Testament. Uh, and a special uh, cabinet at the front uh, that they bring out and process through the crowds and through the congregation. Okay, as with many religions, they have rites of passage or stages of life um, being named. Uh, names are very important in this tradition. Um, initiation to the community, uh, which is the form of a, a very involved baptism. Uh, multiple baptisms, actually. They go from several uh, locations getting baptized. Of course, getting married and at death, um, funeral, cremation, that kind of thing. Daily, uh, they have a ritual bath that they must follow with meditation uh, and a short little devotional rite of prayers and hymns. <coughs> they have several festivals each year. Uh, one for each of the ten gurus, um, and then they also celebrate uh, the four sons of Garbin Singh, Gobind Singh, sorry, uh, who were martyred uh, during a revolt. Amrit Sitar is the Golden Temple uh, in, um, in the Punjab region of India. Uh, you can go and visit it today. They light up at night. You can see on the left. Uh, an exquisite, um, beautiful building and, and temple uh, for the Sikhs. It's also a very popular place uh, for Sikhs to go on pilgrimage to, uh, especially if they did not grow up in India. Okay, so Gobind Singh, whose four sons were martyred and celebrated, um, really developed a more militant Sikhism. Uh, he developed a group a defense group, kind of like a militia, military group uh, for the, the region, for the faith, uh, called the Khalsa. And this is the Brotherhood of the Pure. Uh, and they were just basically set up and established to protect the nation uh, and the general community of Sikhs. Uh, the Sikhs have suffered quite a bit of persecution throughout history, um, so they kind of developed a more defensive, militant uh, type of faith and society. You can kind of see this in, for instance, the um, the present state of uh, Israel, the nation state of Israel, after their founding in the 60s because um, of the hostilities in the region uh, towards them. They're definitely more militaristic and armed. Eventually, he lost through a lot of military offenses, and the kingdom was annexed to Great Britain in 1849, and then, of course, um, in the 1950s when the country went from the British back to the Indians themselves. So the Sikhs in the Punjab region, um, they're still a part of India. They have legal representation uh, in their parliament. However, many of them are still trying to establish an independent state of their own uh, that they can rule themselves. So there's been tensions between India and uh, the Punjab region and the Sikhs themselves, sometimes there's still quite a bit of hostilities. However, Amanama Singh uh, was the first non-Hindu to be Prime Minister in 2004, uh, which was quite um, a big accomplishment for the society. Uh, it's the world's largest democracy, and they elected a Sikh as their president, um, something that would seem unheard of. Uh, in previous times. And that Sikhism 